Okay, so today's session um, we're going to host is on, um, you know, the sort of the big elephant, I guess, in, in this world, which is survivors, survivors' guilt and the impact that it can have um, as you're sort of coming out of your uh, genetic testing process. And um, I think uh, the conversation of survivors' guilt is is um, one that is not discussed as, as much as it should be, and it's a very important conversa conversation to have, especially as we move forward um, into the future, um, knowing and considering the complexities of our, our families and how people go about making decisions, um, but also knowing that um, you know, we carry our own, uh, we carry guilt when we go through the, some of us carry guilt when we've gone through the genetic testing process. Um, and uh, based on our results, but also knowing that uh, now people have the opportunity to have children in different ways and, you know, what that means for survivors growing up in families that um, have come to be formed in, in different ways um, with the medical advances that we have. So um, I'll just introduce myself. My name is Jenna and I am from Canada. I, um, uh, I'm the HDYO mentorship coordinator. HDO has a mentorship program in partnership with the Huntington's Disease Society of America. So I'm fortunate to work with Mary Ann to deliver a mentorship program in the US um, for youth and um, and I Sorry. suffer immensely with survivor's guilt. My this day. is Emma. Hi, I'm Emma. Um, I'm from England and I tested negative back in 2016. Um, I've been a caregiver for my dad and my brother has also tested positive as well. Um, I'm a HDO ambassador and the owner of My Pops and HD on Instagram. Um, hello everybody, my name is Marian. I am Manager of Youth and Community Services at the Huntington's Disease Society of America. I started getting involved um, volunteering about 12 years ago when my mom passed away from Huntington's disease. Um, I've known about Huntington's disease my entire life. She was sick um, since I could remember. I tested negative, I, wanna, I think it's eight years ago now. Um, and it's definitely not just a, the guilt isn't just then thereafter, but definitely continues um, throughout for me every day. So uh, we have some questions prepared and um, I'll start by asking some questions. Um, however, we want to open up the floor to you. If you have any questions, please um, raise your hand or or drop them in the app and, and we, um, we can speak to some of the questions that you might have. But um, so just to get started, to start the conversation, um, I guess the first question is, um, did you have a feeling one way or another of how your testing results would turn out in anticipation of? Yeah. Um, so I actually just shared before in a session for genetic testing that I never realized that I was at risk. Um, I always just assumed because I'm exactly like my mother, um, I look exactly like her, that I was positive and I lived my life that way. It wasn't until somebody brought it to my attention that I should get tested. Um, and then I decided not to. And so when I experienced I dealt with a lot of, and still deal with a lot of mental health issues, and I was in an outpatient program, and somebody had said, you know, you might want to get tested for this, and that was sort of the initiation into, um, maybe I should go start going through this process. And um, once I started, I just knew I had it, and just didn't think that the negative was even an option. Uh, my process took a few years because I stopped and I went and I stopped and I went, and but I didn't have a, a feeling of that it was even a possibility of being negative. 
um, so when it when I did get that negative result, um, I didn't know how to feel. I didn't know how to live. Um, I like to describe it as like I was walking through this HD woods my entire life of knowing how to live and knowing how to experience relationships in life and you know, I'm really good at, you know, setting really big walls up for people in my life. And um, then someone told me that I could get out and I didn't know how to. And I'm still lost at times, right? Um, I just don't know how to live with that. And it's like I was given this lottery ticket that, like, I don't feel like I deserve. Um, I'm picking up on what you said about the fact that you felt like you were positive because you're exactly like your mum. I think from my perspective, I'm nothing like my dad. Um, so I think in a way, I hadn't actually, I almost had a feeling that it was going to be negative, but I can't really explain why other than that. Um, and I genuinely don't think I mentally prepared myself for a positive result. Um, even though you go through genetic counselling, um, I was very much like, yep, I'm going to be tested and just say all the right things almost to get you through the testing process. But I definitely didn't sort of even contemplate what would happen if I had tested positive. Yeah, for... Uh for me, I was, uh, you know, I felt fairly certain. Even before I knew that uh, Huntington's was in my family, I had these, like, nervous sort of, ner like, nervous little tics, like, I'd shake my, shake my leg. And it was something that was always, like, very apparent. Like, people would always say, are you okay? And I'm like, oh, yeah, I just, I didn't even realize. It's, like, bouncing up and down. And, um, <clears throat> and I, I, you know, I, I know it's common, but right before falling asleep, I would have these jerks. And so I was like, oh, that's, that's it. But I, I had this before I even knew that Huntington's was, um, was something that ran in my family. But once I knew, I was like, okay, that's it. And I did your classic um, symptom hunting. And, um, you know, so I was, you know, I was feeling pretty, pretty certain that I, I would carry the, the genetic mutation. Um, <clears throat> so did you, did you feel prepared for a negative result? Was it something that was um, discussed during genetic counseling? Were you prepared for that? Um, I think I, in terms of afterwards, when as soon as I received my result, it was like, oh, just good news, Emma. Um, you haven't inherited the gene. Um, and then I was just sort of, I don't know, I just walked out of the room and then it was like, there was nothing else. So even though I was, I definitely wasn't prepared for either result, whether it was positive or negative. Um, but I feel like there was no real sort of aftercare there for even if you were to be testing negative. Because it's like you build yourself up to this massive event. Um, and then it's almost like, even though I had that feeling that it was okay, it was like, well, what do I do now? Because I've got all of these family members that are also at risk or either tested positive. And it's like, where do I almost fit, fit in or slot in? What do I, what do, I do now? Um, you know, during my lengthy process, um, it was definitely discussed, like, what if you test positive? What if you test negative? And I always just was like, I can't test negative because I need to make sure I have it so nobody else in my family, you know, because that's how that works, right? Um, but that's, I was making these deals with like whatever higher power there is. And I just never, um, never felt prepared for a negative result. And I don't think the clinic that I went to was prepared for my reaction in that moment. Um, in that moment, I... You know, they told me my CAG repeat and, you know, the person in the room with me was very happy and I just screamed, why me? And um, didn't understand why. Okay, okay. I always cry. Don't worry okay. about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I just didn't understand and they didn't expect that. And um, so the following week they reached out and they were just like, we want to check in and I wasn't doing good. And um, um, so they asked me to come in 
and um, I came in a few more times. And then thereafter, they said, we usually don't do this because we usually don't get this response. And we just, or people aren't open about this response maybe because who am I? Why, why, why should I be upset about this? Like, I don't deserve this space to feel this way. Um, and it was, yeah. Um, so I think they created that safe space for me that I needed at that moment. Yeah, I, I had a similar experience to Marianne. And when, um, in, during the genetic testing process, they had mentioned the word survivor's guilt. And I was like, I knew that I wanted to do genetic testing. It wasn't something I wavered on. I once heard a quote that, you know, information is your best friend. I think I watched the movie, do you, a documentary, Do You Really Want to Know? It's a little old now, but it was really, it really helped me in making the decision to do genetic testing. So I knew, I, was, I didn't waver, I knew it was what I wanted to do. And I found the genetic counseling process very helpful. They did mention um, survivor's guilt and they asked great questions and I engaged in the process as one should. And, um, and um, but what I wish in hindsight the genetic counselor would have done is like really for me is like really walked me through the process. And they, you know, asked me to consider who I would bring to get my results. And, and um, you know, I was the first person in, in my family to go through genetic testing that um, wasn't showing symptoms and, um, and to do it in order to make a form, informed decision about the way I was going to go about having children. And I remember, and so of course I brought my, um, I brought my partner with me and I brought my, my mom and my dad and my brother and his wife and my brother was sitting directly across the table from me and and the, the genetic counselor when she opened the envelope she said we're pleased to inform you that and everyone um, had a like gasped like my spouse my sister-in-law my dad and and I was looking directly at my brother who didn't know his genetic status and I was overcome with emotion that how, how did I get in this situation? How, what, how could I have put him in this place? And I never, I never felt relief, I still don't. And it's something that was just so hard for me and I had wished that the genetic counselor at the time would have sat me down and said, okay, you're gonna bring these people. How will you feel? Like think about the reaction, what will you do, you know, like, how, like, how will you feel? And um, because I had never thought that in depth about, I never thought I would experience survivor's guilt and I never thought that it would be so painful for me to, to um, do that with my brother and, and um, who was at risk. And the other thing that I couldn't control is the reaction of the others. And, and my dad, you know, just so absentmindedly said, you know, and now we only need to worry about my son. And so the, you know, the reaction or the, the focus quickly shifted to, to my brother. And it was just, you know, if I could change things, I definitely would have changed that. I wasn't prepared to, to feel that way. And I didn't think of how he would have felt. It was very, very difficult. Um, <clears throat> which I think is a good segue into the question of, um, how have you coped with the negative? Um, how have you coped with the negative result while other family members, friends, and community members uh, remain at risk or or positive? And I think you know there's such a strong sense of community in the Huntington's disease uh, community, and you know um, those feelings. You know, as you build relationships, you carry your grief with you, and you worry about the people that you've connected to. And you continue to hear in the community that others are testing positive people that you, you love and you see changes. So how, how has that impacted you? Um, I had a very similar experience with my brother, like you had. Um, I remember as soon as I got my results, I was there. Um, I was getting my results with my mum. And my brother knew I was going to get my results and the first thing I did when I left the room was phone my brother and I was very much like yourself I hadn't really thought about the implications of me being tested on how he would feel about it um, 
And I remember he was so happy on the phone for me. And when he put the phone down, he rang my mum straight away and said, well, then I've got it. Um, and obviously, I, that's not how it works. Um, but he was like, well, he, I must have it because Emma hasn't. And if I had to say, if one of us had it, then I would want it so Emma didn't have to have it. Um, so it's almost actually brought us a lot closer together, um, me and my brother. Um, and I've got this very sort of protective um, instinct um, with him and my dad. Um, and I'd sort of protect them from anything, I think. Um, I feel like my responsibility, because I've almost been dealt the lucky card, um, is that I have to be the one who stands up um, and protects them and talks for them when they either don't want to or they can't. Um, I don't even remember the question, but um, I know it made me cry as soon as you asked it. So I'm going to go with my gut. Um, so it was really hard um, telling, you know, I didn't want to tell anybody um, my results. I wanted to keep it very private, but people, my support circle wanted to share. And um, so having them share my results um, on public platforms on, um, within one another was really difficult because then there was negative remarks like, why you, right, and not me, um, things like that, um, which I know they didn't mean, but it was just like, how do they not feel that way? I get it. Um, so since it, that day, I remember... Um, family had gathered um, where, at my house, and I just sat in my car for hours, and I had a friend that, sorry, I had a friend that kept calling, and he just texted me, and he said, I know, you can answer, you don't have to feel bad. So I answered, and He's gene positive, and um, he said, this is great. Like, I don't, I'm not mad. And um, he said, you know, you have fought your entire life, and um, you continue to fight for everyone, and now you just don't have an excuse to stop. <laughs> and I live by that every single day. Um, so it's hard every day. I, um, I wish I could take it away from so many people I love and care about. But um, that's why I you know, dove in head first as a volunteer and then decided to make it my career path um, because I just I don't want anyone to have to go through this alone. So. Thanks, Marianne. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, and how, so how, how would you say your survivor's guilt has changed and evolved over time? In the weeks, post-testing, months, the years? I would say as time's gone on, the guilt increases, I would say. Um, particularly now being quite an active person in the community, being an HDO ambassador. Um, you're constantly surrounded and talking to people um, and seeing different stories that are being shared. Um, and I think it's just a sort of a, a constant reminder that I almost feel bad when I post things about my dad because, or how I'm feeling, because I don't feel like it, I feel a bit like a fraud um, in the HD community. Um, but yeah. You would think it would get easier, right? Like mm. from that initial, um, it doesn't. It's definitely a struggle every day. I think especially getting more involved, working with people every day, it makes it even harder sometimes because I care so much about so many people now, right? Like not just my, and it's not just my family. It's I have so many people that I consider family. And um, so it does make it worse. Uh, I think every time I dive in head first more and more every day that it would make it easier and it doesn't. Um, but that doesn't mean I'm going to stop because I don't have an excuse, right? Um, so you'll see me till I'm very old. 
<laughs> uh, so there isn't like, it's not like grief. It's just like grief, right? Like, cause you're grieving something. So there's no timeline for that. And it looks really funny and it's, sometimes it's worse. Sometimes it's not there. Um, it's, it's honestly always there, but yeah, it doesn't get better. <laughs> Um, but that's not, that's just my experience, right? That's not everybody's either, so. When I first started to experience survivor scale, it was right away, it was very immediate for me. Marianne, you mentioned that it was immediate for you as well. Um, and Emma, mm -hmm. after, you, uh, after you spoke to your brother about it, yeah. did you have that sense right away? Right away, yeah. It, I hadn't until that point, and then it was all, but it was like, 10 minutes and it was almost it then hit me that I was like I've been really fortunate in this situation um and it, I think it was main it was the guilt initially that I hadn't even considered how he would react um to my result um yeah and did you did you so at the like so despite recognizing at the time that you were feeling, how you were feeling, did you recognize it as survivor's guilt? And at what point did you, in, in your journey, did you sort of give it that label? Like, this is, I'm, I'm, this is survivor's guilt. I know exact, the exact moment that that happened. Um, I didn't realize it was survivor's guilt. It wasn't discussed with me um, in any of the process or discussions prior to testing and even after the, you know, even those sessions after, and I was even asked to speak to genetic counselors about like my process and things like that. And um, it wasn't until it was two months later, I will never forget the moment someone had asked me how I was feeling and I was shoveling snow. Um, and it was a, a friend in the community that also tested negative. And she's like, no, but how are you really doing? And I just was shoveling snow. And I remember just hysterical crying. And, you know, and she said the word survivor's guilt. And she asked me to speak on, um, about it um, on a more public platform. And at, in that moment, and we had that discussion, but it was, that was the first time. And that's why I was laughing, because it was just like a funny scenario of me shoveling. But anyways. Um, it, yeah, I was very mad, um, but that was the first time it was identified as that. I was like, oh, oh. Yeah. My process was, uh, it was quite a lot different, and okay, that's our warning there. Um, for me, um, the process was quite a lot different. I didn't really, I, I knew how I felt, and it was really bizarre for me because um, I'm very active in patient advocacy and I've been really fortunate enough to sit on a variety of advisory boards with pharma to share the patient's perspective and I share the perspective as a, as a caregiver. And um, over the years I just like, I always like avoid the question, like when it's going to come up, I, you know, you can sense it and I, or when people are discussing it in a conversation, I would and you know, discussing what their genetic status is, I would always get a little like sweaty and uncomfortable and um, start to feel shame. And, I, and then I started to participate in these advisory boards and when we were going around the, you know, you'd often go around the board and, and say who you are and why and what brings you to, um, what brings you to the HD community and how you identify and there would always be one person that would share their genetic status and then, then the next person would and the next person and the next person and I'd always have to write down what I was going to say despite it, you know, just being who I am and not something you should need to write down but I'd always need to write it down because I would, I would get so nervous trying to have the conversation and, and share my status and um, I would feel so shameful, and I could never, I could never find the right words, to, and I didn't want to fumble over the words, and you know, I didn't want to, Im I, I, you know, it, there was just so much shame associated with it. So it wasn't actually until just about <clears throat> a year ago when I sort of came to terms with like, okay, this is really, this is really what I'm feeling, and I need to talk about it more and address it a little bit more because it was so. Um, 
it, it just lingered there, and it, it has had a significant impact on my own relationship with my brother because he's very he's very private. He doesn't want to talk about it, and and because he doesn't want it, I know that he doesn't want to talk about Huntington's disease, and it is just something that he has just pushed in the closet. That um, from the perspective of not carrying the the genetic mutation, I feel very like. Who is, I, there's no place for me to push the conversation. There's no place for me to try and pursue it with him because I'm not in the same place as him, and I've really struggled with that. Are there any questions, any comments, any? It was just what I found really, really interesting, and I'll be very honest about this, is like when we all sat in the auditorium yesterday, Jenna went around and she said about everyone's main objectives and that. And I waited, a bit similarly to like when you say when you're at a conference, you're waiting for someone to say about their gene thing. And I was thinking, when is the right time that I turn around and say one of my goals is that I want to really advocate, not advocate, but again, why can't I say advocate? Advocate for more awareness of survivor's guilt. And I was waiting and waiting and waiting for the right time to kind of go, yeah, Jenna, I've got a goal, I've got a goal. And one of the other um, people that I'm, I'm quite close to was like, you know, I found out two weeks ago I was gene positive. I remember sat there going, how the hell do I follow up after that when they've just said that and go, I just feel ashamed and I just want to talk about survivor's guilt. Mm -hmm. And I think what's really interesting what you guys were saying about as well um, with that aftermath, like I, I shared my genetic test very, very publicly and I was really annoyed, really annoyed because I actually felt that I was given this opportunity for it to be so public in a kind of weird way. I wanted it to be positive because I felt that I let the community down. Mm. Because I didn't give Huntington's the, the biggest opportunity for someone to go, not feel sympathy, but to be like, oh my God, I need to learn how her life is going to carry on from this. And like one of the last footages was like, Charlie, how's your life now? And it's like, obviously, you know, the cameras are in front of me, like, yeah, it's great. But in the back of my head, I'm like, I've just melted down like two hours ago because of this, but you know, it's short and sweet a documentary, you're not gonna wanna know the rest of it. And I just think it's just so interesting. Like I've got two I've got two brothers and like what you're saying, you know, I had my partner and my son in there. And again, like with you Emma, like your brother going, I would rather her had it than me. And I always look at my brothers like they're baby brothers, never my big brothers, and no, they're very taller than me. <laughs> and I'm the oldest and it's that fight or fight where you've got so much maternal instincts where you're like, I just want to protect anyone. Like you said, you can't protect anyone, but I want it to end on a positive note. I just find it fascinating that regardless of if someone's positive or negative, how much they put into HDYO, you couldn't say, God, a positive person puts in more than a negative person. They still put the same oomph and drive, and I just think that's amazing when you think, they're on totally different chapters <coughs> and different paths. And I just, it just blew me away when I came in and I thought, Survivor's girl, oh, it's just going to be, I've got this feeling, and just the way that you spoke about it was so raw and just, yeah, just amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Emma. Thank you. I have a question. So I recently got tested um, and got negative results like a couple of months ago, and one thing that I'm experiencing is that like, I didn't consider is like, I feel like I like lost myself in a way because that I always believed that I have this disease, like I've always lived every decision. And like looking back on it, I would have made different decisions. Like, I don't know. But I don't know, I feel like coping like rather than with the loss of others and how other people feel and loss of this, like I feel like I'm coping with like a loss of self. Did you guys experience that? And like how long did that last for? And like how did you get through it? If you have. Uh, that's a that's a, I'm really glad that you brought that up. It's a, it's a great it's a great comment to make, and I've since I've been you know talking about that and exploring it. I, it's a common, it's a common feeling that comes up that like now you need to like redefine you know, like who am I? You know you've lived all this time. It's a great question. I didn't have that um, experience. Perhaps you can I speak. To didn't that. either. Um, yes. You, sorry. I definitely did, and still do, um, and it's been a long time. I, you know don't, it's so funny, I always went into um, growing up, I was like, I'm never having kids, I'm never getting married, because I was setting those boundaries because of HD, like, that was just, like, the reason, um, and I still don't want kids, I still don't want to get married, so nothing's changed, um, <laughs> but um, 
I don't know. Like, I, I feel like I can't, I still can't plan because I don't, I, I don't know how to. I wasn't mentally prepared to, you know, experience, you know, life past this moment, right? Because my mom was symptomatic in her um, mid to late 20s. She started showing symptoms. So I just thought I never would make it to my 30s um, to have to plan for that. Um, so I'm terrible at saving money. I'm terrible at all these things. And it still continues, but it's because I'm just lost. Um, and I'm trying to find myself and find my voice, um, especially within the community, because it's really hard um, sometimes because I don't feel like I deserve to have one. No answer. Sorry. <laughs> but you're not alone in what you're feeling. It's normal. Um, yeah, I was exactly the same. Oh, I, yeah, because yeah, I spent my whole life thinking I was so like my mum. Um, I was really clumsy, um, messed with my words. And that was 12 years ago. And I still struggle. Because my sister's got it. And so. But I don't have guilt. I don't define it as guilt. I'm trying to look at it. I can be as positive. I'm going to help my mum until she died, which I did. I'm going to help my sister when she deteriorates. I don't, I, I've tried to turn it the other way and go, instead of feeling guilt, that's a wasted thing for me. And it's the way I deal with it. And everybody deals with it differently, don't they? But I deal with it trying to be as positive, I don't look like I am at the minute, but I, <laughs> I, I try and be as positive as possible to do as much as I can in the community because that's my way of dealing with it. I don't feel guilty because I don't, my auntie felt guilty about my mum and I saw her beat herself up about that and I'm not doing that. I'm going to go and be a positive thing about it instead. Yeah. But I have that still feeling that I spent 35 years thinking I was going to get HD. Yeah, um, so my mom is one of four. Three out of the four siblings uh, passed from HD. My uncle um, that tested negative, um, I was the first one after him to test negative. Um, and I'll never forget that moment of sharing it with him, but um, he shared with me, he has since passed, but um, before he passed, um, he's like, please try not to hold on to that guilt because I did my whole life because I had, but he's like, but I know that, um, I did the right thing by my siblings and my family by taking care of them. So turning that right, um, is really important. Like trusting that, like you will advocate for your loved ones or this community or yourself the best way you can. I think I have another question. Um, so... Like, uh, when I first got my results, I was like, oh, I don't have survivor guilt. Like, I was a good person, and I'll be there to help my sisters, and, you know, all of those types of things. But, like, as the days go on, kind of like you get, you guys all said the same thing. Like, I feel like it's getting worse. And, like, I'm starting to experience it. And, like, so I guess retrospectively, since you guys all had the same path and same course of, like, seems like maybe like an increase in this possibly, or very similar. Was there things that maybe looking back that you wish you could have done, or any advice you might give to somebody like me who's following in the same path, I guess? Well, for me, I think my biggest coping mechanism was like to, to get involved in the community, to just dive in head first. And, but I know it's not like that for everyone, and that's okay. It, for me, that's what worked. and and. I, I made the conscious decision to do that. Um, but I've also known people that have stepped back and said, you know, I'm, I'm not quite ready and I'm gonna step away and I'll come back if I'm ready and, and yeah. that's okay too. I think through that process of like trying, like having those discussions of like, what if I'm positive, what if I'm negative, like what would I have done differently leading up to getting that result? Um, no matter what your result is, you don't know how you're gonna re respond to it. So there's no like, changing the preparation period kind of thing. Um, I mean, I would have changed a lot about my process, um, but I don't think I would have done anything different. I think maybe talking and discussing more about, like, how I'm going to support myself after no matter what. Yeah, I agree with that, actually. I think definitely I um, have never been great at talking or opening up 
Um, so literally this is the first time I've ever spoken about survivor's guilt and I've never spoken to family about it, never spoken to friends about it. So my advice would be to talk about it. Definitely. Yeah. And there's also too, um, through uh, HGSA, there, there are youth social workers that you can chat to about your experience. And I'm sure other, I would assume other associations, I can't speak about other associations we have it in Canada, but that you can talk to about your, your feelings. Yeah. So that was going to be my question, because um, do you feel that the, the genetic process is up to getting your results? You've got extra support because of your reaction, but I got my result and that was it really, there was yeah. nothing else. Do you feel that they perhaps should look at that? And mm -hmm. I, yeah, I definitely think so. Absolutely. I was talking to somebody yesterday and they were saying that um, I think each like district is different as well and each county is different, particularly in the UK. And I know people who have tested negative, but I've then continued to have genetic counselling afterwards. And that was just not, never on my radar. It was you're shipped off and have a great life sort of thing and nothing about anything to do with, well, what does that mean and what is that going to impact on the rest of your life? I think the conversation is really important because now, you know, in the community, I have friends who um, <clears throat> have children, and they found out that they um, they already started having children before they knew that they carried uh, the uh, genetic mutation, and found out later, and have made a decision to have. Uh, they had children naturally, and then uh, had a child had a child via IVF that is, that they know will not carry the genetic mutation. And so now there's the dynamic which we see popping up that you know families are different, and and some may have been some people m may um, have gone through the process of IVF knowing one child doesn't have the gene, one does, and and just the dynamic that it it creates, um, and, you know, and and those. Uh, wonderful little babies are, are going to be here in 15 years and 20 years and and I think it's important we open up the space and really start to have those conversations now because um, it's not going away. And I, don't, I think also like survivors guilt we forget it's not just necessarily the person that tested gene negative it's spouses it's cousins it's friends you know um, that just you know, guilt isn't just one way, right? Um, it's definitely multiple ways, and I think more people experience it than we realize. Okay, we need to wrap up. We're, we're continuing on, but I think the fact that this um, conversation is um, going long is a just perfect example that we need to continue to have it. I see you have a question, so I'll, uh, can we chat out there? I think there might be another session. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.